So good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Um, on behalf of the Tufts Career Center and the Office of Pre-Health Advising, I'd like to invite and welcome you to interviewing as a pre-health student. I'll start with my introduction. My name is Malaika Silcott. I'm one of the undergraduate career advisors in the Tufts Career Center. And the career community that I oversee um, is health, life sciences, and the environmental affairs section. And I will be presenting this workshop with Rob. Hi, everyone. I'm Rob LaRocco. I'm one of your health professions advisors at Tufts. I'm really excited to be working with Malaika in the Career Center um, to provide you all with this first part of our interview uh, series. Great. So welcome. Um, we will have some time at the end to uh, take some of your questions, but for the most part, uh, we do have quite a few slides and Rob and I are gonna be tag teaming uh, together. But before we get started, um, I would like to kind of pull the audience and kind of get a sense of what you're thinking about when you think about interviewing as a pre-health student. So give me one second while I start the poll. So you should see it pop up on your screen. And what Rob and I would like you to do is probably pick your best three answers. So we would like to know, what are your concerns or what do you want to know about interviewing? So take a look at those answers and kind of identify what are your top three reasons for wanting to know about interviewing? And this will be anonymous and I will show the results in a second. All right, we'll take a few more minutes. I see them coming in. Again, for the person that just started. Okay, perfect. All right, so we're gonna end the poll. Really excited about this. And then Rob, tell me if you see the results on the screen. Do you see the results? I can, yep, I can see them. Okay. So it looks like when we ask you what you wanna know about interviewing, the top answers are maybe how to talk about personal adversity, maybe, maybe you had a bad semester. Um, a lot of people, and this is not surprising, a lot of people wanna know how to answer that first question or get a summary of all the lovely stuff that you know how to do um, or experiences that you've had. And then it looks like the next popular answer might be how to demonstrate what you've learned in your pre-med or your pre-health or your STEM courses. Um, so thanks. Um, everybody's reasons are different. Um, and that's why we um, had that poll um, is because we wanted to kind of see um, what people thought about that. So I'm going to hopefully take this off the screen. Uh, okay. All right, sorry, just a little technical difficulties. Okay. So we wanted to know what advice you've already heard about interviewing. And like I said, everybody's reasons for um, coming in and getting advice about interviewing is different. So I've put on the screen a few of the reasons or rationales or advice that people have heard along the way. You know, maybe the interview won't count because it's really just about what test score you get on the MCAT or you know, you have to say exactly what you said in your personal statement or your cover letter, um, and that's very important. Or it really just doesn't matter. It's about you know my personality or my connections, and that's what's going to really get me into this opportunity. So we want you to put all of that aside, and we want you to think about um, some of the techniques that we're going to talk about today. So our workshop today is we're going to talk a little bit about just mystifying what this interview process is. What exactly are they looking for? Um, then we're going to talk a little bit about or mainly about how to answer behavioral questions. And also Rob is going to talk a little bit about uh, the differences for applying to medical school and some of the ways that they uh, assess their candidates. 
Then we're going to talk about actual behavioral interviewing and how to answer certain types of questions. What are What is the interviewer looking for? And some strategies for being concise and talking about some of those things that we asked you about that you're, you're most worried or concerned about. And there's also a technique called the STAR or START method. So we'll give you examples of what that means. And then finally, we'll go over um, online resources and in-person resources on campus if you wanna take this to the next step, depending on your audience. And then we'll leave maybe 10 minutes at the end uh, for questions. This workshop is gonna be recorded, um, except for the question portion, we'll end the recording before then. So make note of the questions that you have towards the end of the session. So we're gonna start with what is the role of the interview? So if you think about it, an interview is just one of the many things that people use to assess you. They, from the minute that you are applying to a position or a school, they're looking at your communication skills. So an interview can be a way that they're assessing the way you um, talk to others, your personality, and get to know you and what you're strongest uh, for. Um, and answer questions based on the application materials that you've already submitted. They could be a way to understand your career goals and context and look for maturity um, for continued study if you're thinking about medical school or professional school. And they also can be used to assess how well you've prepared uh, for a particular opportunity. And more um, last but not least, they can be used to determine a little bit more detail about why you are interested, why them, what is it about their specific school, their specific organization that interests you. And something that I want to make sure that everyone understands about um, professional school admissions interviews is that if you are invited to interview, the admissions committee has already determined that you can do it. They think you can do the work in professional school. They like what they've seen in your primary application and your secondaries. Now they just need to know who the real you is. So when you get an invitation to interview, when you're at that interview, you need to know and you need to be confident that they are very, very interested in you. So don't go in there, no matter what the, how the questions are posed, right? Um, don't think, oh, I'm, I'm not supposed to be here. This is a mistake. It is very much not a mistake. They are very, very interested in you. So go in there with confidence and take the information that we have to provide throughout the rest of this presentation and do your best to apply it. So next, we'd like to talk about the types of interviews that pre-health students are more likely to get. So as I mentioned, we are gonna focus more on behavioral interviewing. So this is why our, the title of our workshop is called Interviewing as a Pre-Health Student Part One, um, just to kind of get you started. And so we will cover what's known as a behavioral interview. So the point of behavioral interviews is to allow you to pick different points in time and think about past experiences that you've had and what you've learned from those situations. Um, your responses can help the person interviewing you get a sense of how you behave around others and what you learned um, and how you challenged yourself in different experiences. So I'm going to talk just briefly about MMIs. Um, most of you have probably heard of MMIs or multiple mini interviews. Um, these became popular in the last five or six years. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail. Again, as Malika said, this is uh, the focus is on behavioral interviewing and um, skills and techniques related to that. Um, but essentially what MMIs are, they're very short um, scenario based interview questions. Um, it really requires you to draw on your own professionalism, your communication skills um, in order to be able to consider the question that's posed, which you will have time to consider, and then develop and um, provide your response. Um, if you go to, and most of you who are applying this cycle, um, you should have access to the HPRC Canvas course. Um, within the Canvas course, there's a great deal of information, including information and resources on what MMIs are and how to prepare for them. So please be sure um, to visit 
uh, the HPRC Canvas course when you have time. So just as important, um, as I mentioned, you want to know who you're speaking with. So it's very important early on to identify who that audience is, because that can help you predict the questions and maybe put some of your nerves at ease. Um, so you may want to know what questions may be asked from your application, what questions you might want to ask about the opportunity, and that could be based on who the person is that you're going to be talking to. And again, this will help you best prepare um, on some of the things that you may want to talk about um, that's in your application materials. So determining your audience um, can be very important. So we're going to start with before the interview or having a plan. So definitely under, understand who your audience is. So we've, I've divided this slide into virtual interviews and in-person interviews. Um, so obviously for virtual interviews, you wanna make sure that you're in a quiet space. You wanna limit external uh, distractors. So if you have roommates, uh, you wanna make sure that you know, they know that you're gonna be interviewing online um, or you're able to blur your background or put a sign on your door or even find space um, in the library or other places on campus. Lighting is just as important as sound. So you wanna make sure that, you know, if your lights are gonna time out or if it's a, during a part of the day where the sun is not coming in, uh, you wanna make sure that you can control for that. Um, you also wanna know how long the interview is. So sometimes the length of the interview can help you plan out what you want to talk about and how long you want to answer each question. Um, particularly if you're doing this online, um, if you have other applications open, you may want to put them on snooze or close them out so that you don't get alerts, especially with your phone, that you don't get alerts or alarms while your interviewing is going on. The third thing I mentioned in terms of format is you may want to know the interview schedule. Um, Rob can talk a little bit about this, but particularly with a professional skill interview, it may have different components. They may have a virtual part. They might have you talk to different faculty members or even past medical school students. Um, so you really want to think about what that interview attire looks like. Um, uh, sorry, interview format. As far as interview attire, you want to dress the part. So you could have, doesn't matter what shoes you have on, um, because maybe they'll just see from your, your waist or your neck or your shoulders up. But sometimes there are uh, studies that show that if you dress a certain way, you act a certain way. Um, so if you are dressed uh, professionally or appropriately or comfortably from the top down, you're more likely to give a more confident interview and look in the camera. If the interview is in person, uh, make sure you know where you're going, uh, plan it out ahead of time, um, know before you go, know exactly where the building is, what floor, who you're meeting with, if you're gonna need access or ID. Um, again, interview schedule is just as important in an in-person interview and dress. Uh, we have maybe some pointers on dress, but always dress with something that's neat, no, no holes, um, something that makes you feel at ease, something that you've worn before when you've had a, um, a high, I'm going to call say high stakes uh, uh, environment or where you're trying to make an impression. Uh, so a few things that I'll um, add on. Um, so most um, medical and dental school interviews are still being held virtually. So that is something to keep in mind. This can change at any time, but when you do get your invitation um, to interview, this is something that will be described in the invitation, including um, what the day will look like, your schedule. Um, th they won't necessarily, probably, tell you how you should address you should dress, but um, I would always err on the side of um, more formal versus casual. So um, for you know. Uh, Males, it's probably going to be a suit, a tie. Um, females, um, pretty much whatever you want, as long as it's considered professional. Um, Malika mentioned appearance. Um, basically, you just kind of want to look clean and put together, not like you just rolled out of bed. Um, you don't want to uh, 
show up to the interview looking disheveled with wrinkly clothes or your hair is kind of all over the place. Um, and this comes with preparation. So make sure you take the time, scope out um, you know, your location if you're gonna be sitting for a virtual interview or the in-person location if you need to locate um, a building. Um, a couple other things. Um, uh, yeah, I think that, oh, one that I did wanna mention. So a lot of um, medical schools now are doing these sort of pre-interviews, okay? This is essentially an asynchronous um, interview where you have questions presented to you, not by an actual person, but you're recorded responding to those questions and then the medical schools will use that. So that will be something that you'll also want to um, practice and kind of get used to because it will feel a little strange, but that falls into the, that virtual interviewing category. So in addition to kind of getting a sense of the setting of the interview, you also wanna take a, a little time reflecting on you. So before any interview, whether it's for school, grad school, professional school, or organization, or even volunteering, you want to get to know yourself. Reflect on things that you've talked about with advisors, times where you, um, you know, times that you, you felt like you did the thing that you came to do, or times where it was really tough, but you kind of consulted resources and you were able to get through it. Um, so think of you in different settings, not just places or times where you did well, but also times where you struggled. You also want to research search the organization. Again, this depends on whether it's a school or an actual organization or employer. Um, just because it's medical school doesn't mean that you can't look and see or talk to uh, alumni or other people who have gone to that school before. Um, if it's an organization, people who have applied or people who have interned or people who have worked there. And then based on these two things, develop a strategy, um, practice, and we don't advise memorizing, um, but basically have a plan. So I mentioned researching the organization. So um, Rob is going to talk a little bit about researching it um, if it's a professional school. Okay, so researching your professional schools that you want to apply to each and every one is an absolute must, okay? And this is something that needs to be done well before you even submit your application to apply to those schools. So um, of some things to look for, um, the school's mission statement, all right? It's not enough to just locate the mission statement and read it, but you need to understand what the mission statement means, what it means to you, even how your activities or who you are as a person might be reflected um, in that mission statement or reflect the ideals that are um, stated in the, mission, in the mission statement. Um, as far as location, um, location can be really important for many reasons. Um, not only um, considering whether you're an in-state student versus an out-of-state student and what that means for tuition, but also acceptance rates, um, but also um, what's the relationship between the professional school and the city in which it's located or the neighborhood that it's located in. Um, those are just a few examples um, to look for and consider with regards to location, but there's much, much more. As far as reputation, so recognition and awards, things like that, um, you can probably all find information from U.S. News about different rankings. Um, they even go so far as ranking certain specialties um, at certain medical schools. Uh, I would not spend too much time on this because for most um, applicants, if you have a specialty in mind, let's say psychiatry, all right, as you're applying to medical school, you wouldn't necessarily want to tell an admissions committee that, you know, you're really stoked for that school because they're psychiatry um, program is ranked so high, you know, by US News. Um, and the reason for that is because the vast majority of um, medical students change their minds with regards to their specialties. Once they actually get into medical school, once they start to do rotations, they realize that there are so many other possibilities and they tend to um, move away from that one specialty that they initially thought that they definitely wanted to go into. So I wouldn't worry so much about the school's um, reputation, all right, or perceived prestige. Um, as far as class size, 
you really have to think about what the class size means to you. Some medical schools, the class size is fairly small. We're talking 50 to 100. Some medical schools, the class sizes are very large. We're talking 100 to 300. Um, so if you say, well, I'm really excited about, you know, the, the small class size, why? Why is that small class size important to you? If the large class size is, is important to you, why, why is that a benefit? What, what might you benefit from, from being part of a larger class size? Um, in terms of the curriculum or research labs, this is a little bit tricky um, because, you know, not everyone um, is, has a background in education or pedagogy. So you may not necessarily understand the intricacies of a particular curriculum um, and what that might mean to you or how it might be beneficial to you. Um, but if that is something that you really want to look into, um, my suggestion is if you go to Boston University's um, School of Medicine's website, um, they actually went through a big rehaul of their medical education, um, um, their, their uh, first and second year curriculum. So they do a really good job of explaining the process that they went through um, with turning over to this new um, curriculum and explaining why they feel it's going to be beneficial. And that's something that you could take and, and use when you're researching other schools and trying to get a sense of whether or not a particular curriculum or, or instructional styles might be um, a good fit for you or not. Um, as far as research labs, this is something that if you're applying as an MD PhD um, applicant, this could obviously be very important to you um, to look into. Um, for those of you who are applying traditional MD, if you just are interested in possibly um, being involved in research while you're in medical school, um, just looking to see if that is an opportunity is, is something that you should do. Uh, as far as graduates and being able to connect with um, graduates of Tufts who have attended certain medical schools. Uh, later on in the presentation, Malika is going to share some links with you about how you might connect with Tufts alumni and kind of pick their brains about schools who have uh, um, invited you to interview. Uh, I, I will note here, though, this is really important. Um, you should wait until you get an invitation to interview before you start reaching out to alumni. OK, it won't do you any good to reach out before you've even applied or before you've been invited to interview. Um, so consider that. Um, student clubs and organizations, these can be really important to help you um, not only continue with some of the passion, the things that you were passionate about and were involved in as an undergrad, but these are also ways that you can get involved and you can start to develop um, a sense of community um, with your fellow medical students and a sense of belonging. And that can go a really long way um, in terms of health and wellness, all right, which is um, a really big, a really big deal in medical schools and professional schools in general. Um, lastly, Tufts alumni um, or current current students. Again, Malika will share some information with you um, so that you can connect with them in various ways. Great, thanks, Rob. That was very helpful. Um, so as you as you all see here um, in the column to the side, whether it's a volunteer position, an internship, or a full-time job, some of the research in terms of components are going to be similar. Um, so in terms of you know, it being uh, uh, organization, you may want to know, you may want, they may want to ask, they may ask you, you know, why us? Why do you want to work for our organization? And some people will say, oh, because it's a small organization um, or it's a, I'm looking for, I've been in a small organization and I want more of a larger organization um, because I can work in a number of different uh, roles or a number of different projects. Um, you also want to know about the services. So, um, you may want to know how they intersect uh, with the community, especially if you're interested in community health, um, or what demographics um, are are in the the services that they offer. Who do they offer their services to, and what is the mission behind that? Um, same thing in terms of customers. If it's a business organization, it's usually customers, but usually when it's in a helping role, it's usually clients. So again. Who are the um, services offered to? 
uh, what kinds of clients and where do they get their clients and maybe room for growth. So um, again, this research can help you in answering your, the questions they ask you, but it can also help you define what questions that you ask them um, throughout the interview. So this kind of can be towards the end, but this is just giving you um, an overview of some of the resources that we generally have for finding other jumbos. So if you have a LinkedIn account, we have the Tufts University Career Network, which is the largest uh, Tufts group on LinkedIn. Um, and that can be beneficial for a number of reasons um, because it allows you to direct message somebody in the same group. Um, and then the other major resources that we have is the Tufts Herd, um, which is a mentoring database, which is staffed by alumni volunteers. Um, the Herd, just right before spring break, went through um, a big transition. So they're still working out some of the bugs. So they're calling it Herd 2.0. So if you have had experience with the herd uh, database in the past, it may look a little different now. And if you've never used it before, um, and you just want to kind of look through and see what it's about, give it another week or so, I'm told. <laughs> um, but it was definitely uh, established in 2019 as a way for current students and alumni to connect with uh, alumni volunteers who want to share their advice about interviewing, salary negotiation, um, graduate and professional school, and there's many other topics as well. So we're going to get into kinds of questions, because um, I see we're already halfway through the session. Um, but again, in terms of evaluating where you are um, going into any interview, you want to get a sense of what things you feel you're good at, what experiences you've had, uh, reflect on past conversations, and why this position or school is important to you. What kinds of things do you uh, feel you can how can you grow in your career as a result of this opportunity? And generally, in terms of developing a strategy, um, we always say to identify between five and six key points that you may want to that you want to make sure that you get across during the time. Um, whether it's you know ex certain experiences, uh, your communication skills. Um, examples of teamwork or examples of challenging situations, like I mentioned before, and how you got through them. Um, and then once you figure out those kinds of aspects, which again, if you are applying for medical school and you put this in your personal statement, think of stories or examples. Um, and so when you do that, you're making yourself ready for open-ended questions. And some of those questions could be, as you mentioned in the beginning, Tell me about yourself. What do you know about our organization? How have you prepared for this next step um, in your career? And uh, one of my favorite questions, do you feel like your grades or all the effort that you've put in so far, um, do you feel that that uh, reflects your work um, and your academic ability? So these are all open-ended questions where there's no right or wrong answer, but it does require you to think about um, how you've done or experienced these things throughout. So we're not going to get a chance to practice um, in this session today, but we're practicing by learning what a behavioral question is. So I mentioned earlier that a behavioral question is a way for the interviewer to kind of uh, ask you a question about a certain time or period in your life um, and for you to tell a story and then basically document what you've learned or how you've grown from having that experience. So on the screen, you'll see that there are examples of behavioral questions and they may not necessarily be worded exactly like this during an interview, um, but as you're looking through these questions, you should be thinking about why is this interviewer asking me this question? What, are, what kinds of competencies or what kinds of things are they hoping that a story might show them about who I am. So you'll see here on the first one, and I'm not going to go through all of them, but it says, tell me why you're interested in medicine or why medicine. It could just be a why medicine question. Um, but maybe they want more detail. 
explaining what have you done to investigate that medicine is the area or your pathway uh, for you. And so again, that necessitates you to think about times in your life. Now, if the interview is only 30 minutes or 45 minutes, you could probably fill that up with that one question, right? So this may require you to really think about different points um, in which you have explored your interest in medicine. It doesn't have to be from elementary school all the way up to college because you don't have time for that. Um, but think about different points. Maybe it was a class. Maybe it was um, a speaker that came to your student organization. Maybe it was an article that you read. Maybe it was a STEM course that you took. So think about one or two of those examples and then use that to answer the question. But usually behavioral questions will always trigger a story. So if you see in the second question, please describe any experience you've, experiences you've had working with sick people, right? So for those of you who have shadowed, um, those of you who have actually been on site in a healthcare uh, organization or field, um, you may have those stories already and you can document what that is and what you've learned from that. Um, I'm jumping down a little bit towards the middle and then I'll move on. Um, another question here is, as a pre-med or pre-dental student, what skills have you learned to help manage your time and relieve stress, right? Because a lot of you are taking a major and you're taking your pre-med or your health classes or your STEM classes on top um, of the classes that you have for your major. And so if you're going into medical school, um, it's going to be very rigorous and some uh, schools may want to know what what, is, what are the ways you're managing your study habits and your study skills? Because if they know how you're doing that now, that might give them an indication of how you will do when you're faced with even tougher situations. Um, and then the last um, question that I'll kind of focus on before I move on is, can you please describe one of your strengths and one of your weaknesses? So not sure how this comes up in medical school interviews, but for interviewing for jobs um, or internships, maybe not volunteer. Sometimes uh, employers, particularly hiring uh, supervisors, supervisors may want to know what do you do well and what areas you know challenge you, because that can help them decide what training you may need to have before coming into their work setting. But it also allows you to show a little bit of vulnerability. So my advice on that question is I usually start with answering the weakness question first and I frame it as a challenge. So I think about what kinds of experiences have challenged me in the past and then talk about how I've gotten through that challenge. And then with the strengths, you just basically talk about something that you were able to successfully learn from or successfully do, and then you end up with a positive note. So there are many different ways to ask behavioral questions. So one of the strategies for answering behavioral questions is using the STAR method. So some of you may be familiar with this. So usually the way that I like to practice this is on a sheet of paper. Once you have a sense of the stories that you want to, to, to practice, you uh, vertically write down S-T-A-R. Okay, again, we're not trying to memorize it, we're just trying to create a framework. So S is usually the setting um, or the situation. T is usually the task or the problem. So for those of you who have done research in a lab, task could be what were you trying to find out or your hypothesis. For those of you who are talking about a health experience or an experience that you had, um, it could be what were you hoping to, what was your goal? A is the action. So action is always, what did you do? What did you implement? How did you show initiative? Um, you know, what kinds of actions you did on the job or in the volunteer or internship experience? And then the R is very, very important. R, uh, if you're doing research, can be talking about the results of the research or talking about your part of the research and what you found out. And then I also like to think of R as kind of like reflections or reactions. So 
R is um, kind of like what you learned. How did you grow from the experience? And then last but not least, I mentioned that some people use this framework as star or and they add a T. So T is always take it back to them. Make sure that at the end of your answer to the behavioral question, you talk about how it could be important uh, for that organization, um, the skills that you've learned. Um, the only other thing that I will say about preparing a STAR answer is that sometimes when students respond um, using this framework, they spend too much time start talking about the, the setting. And then it's so unclear what the issue was that they were trying to find out. Another uh, challenge can be if you're talking about research. So an example of a behavioral question could be, tell me about a time you worked as part of a team or part of a group. And a lot of times people want to give credit to the team and that's great, but you're there to, for them to evaluate you and how you are in a setting. So you can talk about the team, but you also want to make sure you talk about what you specifically did and or your contributions to the project. And then R, um, a lot of people sometimes may leave that out. <laughs> so again, you want to have your story be succinct by making sure that the interview understands how this experience um, helped you grow. And then T, how did this experience not only help you grow, but how can it be helpful? Um, how, how can it be helpful for them to learn how you might uh, act in a setting? if you were accepted into the job or accepted as a, a, a school candidate. So the next slide is just showing you, again, um, some of the popular or some typical questions. Again, the question might not actually be worded exactly how it is on the left, but this slide is basically um, constructed to show you different ways you might think about answering that question. So um, for somebody that's going into healthcare um, and you might realize that, you know, the world is global. Everyone is um, experiencing, um, you know, when you go into a hospital, you know, the cultures that are represented in the hospital, the languages that are represented in the hospitals, um, or even in work settings are so various and diverse. So if somebody were to ask you, please tell me about an experience where you had exposure to and or learned about another culture, what could they be asking, right? And so if you look over to the right, um, that person could be trying to get a sense of just your exposure to a variety of diverse individuals or environments or they may be wanting to know how you communicate effectively with people who are different than you. So again, if you kind of have a sense of the types of interview questions that could be asked, you can think about these things in your own background and then prepare stories related to that, okay? And then some of you had asked um, in the beginning poll, you know, how to talk about adversity, right? Um, this can be very, um, this has come up in some of the mock interviews that I've done where people feel like it's an interview, you should only talk about the good things, right? And situations where you've operated, um, you know, without any, any difficulty. And that I think is a myth, because I think people learn from you based on how you you know, bounce back from situations. So if somebody were to ask you to tell me about a time where you experienced a challenge or, you know, you participate in research that didn't go the way or there was a conflict, what could they be learning from you? They're trying to learn what motivates you to overcome challenges. How do you problem solve, right? And how do you push yourself to be the best that you can be, okay? All right. So I really quickly, because um, I know we're coming on time, but I want to, um, uh, the last couple slides that Malika just went over, um, the STAR method um, and uh, how you create the story. So this is for you, those of you applying to medical and dental schools, 
Um, this really relates to those core competencies for entering medical students that you probably hear your pre-health advisors talking so much about. So when we talk to you about have you demonstrated these core competencies, the demonstration, how you describe having demonstrated these core competencies, it's that story. You're not, you're not going to say, oh, I, I demonstrated cultural competence this way. Right. That's not that's not how medical schools are going to ask you if you've done that. Right. They're going to ask you about your experience working with diverse individuals or people from underserved communities. Um, things like resiliency. Right. Goes right back to how do you talk about a time where you experience adversity. Right. For you to be able to sort of be vulnerable, as Malika said, and talk about a time when you overcame an obstacle, that's a demonstration of resiliency of adaptability. So all of these things go right back to those core competencies. So make sure you keep those core competencies in mind, review them if you haven't done it in a while, um, but definitely make sure you do it before um, you start preparing for interviews. Okay, so now you're in the interview. All right, what what's going on? So um, these are just a few tips. Um, Remember that you're, you're being interviewed by anyone you meet. So even if you come in on a Zoom, there could be a current medical student who's helping to run the meeting for the admissions um, committee. Um, and even though that person could be nice and bubbly and super friendly, um, they're going to talk about how you interacted with them or whether you didn't really interact with them very much. So um, you need to be always be on as soon as that um, that uh, Zoom session starts um, or as soon as you step foot on campus, because no matter who you come into contact with, if you're a jerk to someone, they're probably gonna report back about that. So um, just keep that in mind. Um, Nonverbal communication is very important um, for all types of interviews, but um, smiling, uh, making eye contact, which is kind of weird when you're on Zoom, but that's why we talked about making sure your camera's posit or your um, screen um, is positioned just below the camera so that it does at least appear that you're looking at their, it, looking at them in the eyes when you're looking through your um, camera. Um, but try to make sure you're in that general direction. Um, again, if you're in person and you know someone extends their hand to shake it, you can do that. I know a lot of people that it's now turned um, into a fist bump rather than a handshake. So just kind of be aware of that. Um, Good posture, so sitting upright, um, leaning in a little bit, uh, trying not to fidget with your hands or anything else um, around your computer or, um, you know, if you're just sitting there in, in an um, in-person interview. Um, and being careful when you think. I, I'm guilty of this. My face tends to uh, project exactly what I'm thinking, even though I'm not talking. So. Um, if you, if anyone has told you that you're this kind of person, be aware of that, okay? Um, if you're thinking, it's okay if you, you know, look to the right or look to the left, but the majority of your time, your eyes need to be on that camera, all right? Um, the other thing is uh, try to, try to be confident, all right? Um, if you're not confident, if you don't project confidence in being there and knowing that, you know, you are someone who they should admit to their program, it's going to be really hard for that interviewer to um, be confident in you. Um, be articulate. Uh, try to avoid some of the fillers. Uh, I do it all the time. Uh, you know, the ums and the ahs, but try to do your best to uh, just pause if you need to pause rather than using the fillers. Um, it, when you're asked a question, as much as you can, avoid simply responding with yes or no. Yes or no gives no information. It certainly isn't a story, all right? So try to avoid that. Uh, try to establish rapport whenever you can. And uh, when Malika and I were, were working on this uh, presentation, I talked about how sometimes people talk about how much they hate small talk. Um, it can be such a drag, but guess what? Small talk is actually a really important skill. Being able to engage in conversation, with a stranger right away, that's something that every physician, dentist, whoever it might be, that is something that you need to be able to do because you're often going to be interacting with patients and their families um, for the very first time. 
All right. And so you need to find a way to put them at ease, try to find some kind of common ground or interest that you both share. Um, it can be a little bit tricky, but at least um, a try to make the effort to do that. Stay positive and engaged um, and be yourself. You know, go in there just knowing that this is who you are. Be authentic. Don't try to do things or say things that you think the interviewer wants to hear because it's not, it's uh, ultimately going to come across as um, being ingenuine. Um, a big one, don't complain. All right. We've all been there. We've all had people that have, you know, uh, supervisors or friends or whoever, employers, um, you know, don't complain about them. All right. If you had an issue or you experienced some adversity, uh, talk about what you learned from that experience, right? Don't say, oh, this was the worst place to work, you know, or I couldn't believe this physician did this, right? Because you never know the full story in the first place, but no one wants to hear you complain about a situation, okay? So try, try to remain positive if you, if you can. All right, uh, remember why you're there, okay? You're either there to get the internship or the job, or you're there to get into professional school. Do not let this um, goal uh, get out of sight. Um, all of your answers should be related should be related to getting you to getting what you are there for, um, which is to get admitted or to get the position. Um, and this is why really important to have really good, insightful questions to ask when the interviewers are done asking you questions. So uh, always, always have questions to ask about the school, um, about the location, about the curriculum, whatever it might be. Um, and try, if you can, make sure that those answers to your questions can't easily be found online. All right, that's, a, that's an important one because if it's something that is blasted right on the homepage of their website, then it might, um, show them that you really didn't spend much time looking into their program before um, applying and attending your interview. Uh, lastly, the bridge. You want to be sure to create a bridge from your knowledge, skills, and abilities to the program um, or organization's needs or values. For those of you applying to professional school, this is really about creating a bridge between who you are and your experiences and why they have helped you or how they have helped you to understand and learn about your intended career, um, how they've helped you to be successful in medical school. Um, but in terms of your experiences, how those skills that you've gained, the knowledge that you've gained through them will be useful to you later on as a physician. You need to be able to articulate that to the admissions committee. They shouldn't be the ones who have to guess, well, this person was on the track team, but I'm not really sure how this has, what this has to do with medical school. You need to be able to explain that to them. And then as far as um, closing the interview, and we only have two more slides and we'll take um, some of your questions and stop the recording. Um, closing the interview depends on how you wanna close it, but most interviews, um, they might ask if there's time left, do you have any questions for us? And so part of that, again, goes into the prep. Some questions might come naturally in the course of the interview. Um, and if you can try and you know make a quick note or a couple of words um, of why you, what question you want to ask, but hopefully you come into the interview already having a couple um, in mind. Um, ask questions that show that you're interested in that particular organization. It could even be about the person that's you know interviewing you, depending on what their role is. Um, but I always just generally tell people have at least three questions prepared. But if you prepare more and they answer some, now you have at least one. Okay. Um, if it's for an internship or job or volunteer experience, sometimes towards the end, um, if you feel like they haven't asked you a question and remember at the beginning, I said, you know, think of your best stories or think of like a couple of pointers that you want to get across. If you feel like they didn't ask that question and you had a story prepared, you can simply use this, this part of the interview to say, 
you know, I just want to, you know, before we end, I just want to reiterate my interest for the position. I really think I could be a good fit for this organization or in this role because it would allow me to learn, blah, blah, blah. So you want to make sure that you show um, enthusiasm and that you've really thought or can see yourself being a part of their organization and you can state that. And then I think Rob, you had something here about professional schools. You might have already said that. Uh, for the middle section? Yeah. Um, honestly, for this part, everyone, the professional school side is going to be a little bit different. Um, you're not going to ask them, uh, you know, when you're going to hear from them um, because medical schools and other professional schools, they can literally make admissions decision decisions all the way up to the first day um, of classes starting. OK, usually they will let you know, but not always. Um, you could be waitlisted, um, but what you could ask if again you couldn't find it on their website you could ask if updates are acceptable and how you might submit those so if you are planning to be in or take part in some type of experience after the interview right and this is something that would be really new to add um you know that would be something that might be acceptable to then update the the admissions committee on sometime down the road if you haven't already heard from them and either gotten um, an offer of acceptance or even waitlisted. Um, some schools allow this, many schools do not. So just be aware of this policy um, for each of the schools that you apply to. Um, the thing that you can do is make note of the people who um, interviewed you. Don't do this while they're talking to you. Um, do this once the interview is wrapped up. Um, just something to on the side that you can um, scratch their names on um, right after it's what while it's fresh in your mind. And I think this process would probably be the same for both types of audiences, but um, following up and saying thank you notes if you have access to their information, mm -hmm. if it's easily um, uh, retrieved from maybe a website or maybe an email that you've got. But at least for the job and interview um, types of positions, I've had some employers tell me if a student doesn't say thank you, they assume that they're not interested. So it's just kind of like a common courtesy. Um, back in the day when I was interviewing a lot, um, people actually would mail note cards, but now an email is appropriate. And sometimes you can send one email and put all the names of the people who were in your interview in the one email. And then sometimes people like to do it separately. But definitely thank them um, for meeting with you. And then the last slide um, is just showing you some of the variety of different things um, that you can use to continue um, preparing. Um, on the Career Center website, which um, is last, but it's not necessarily, it doesn't have to be last, it could be first. Um, but the Career Center website, we have a channel on preparing for interviews. Um, so on, if you go on our website, which is careers.tufts.edu, um, we have a section of our website called Learn More About. And when you click on Learn More About, it takes you to interviewing. So that's one way that you can get advice on certain questions. We also offer mock interviews for the Career Center. Um, usually these are 30 minutes. Um, usually we get a chance to ask you two or three questions. Um, if you do do this, um, it's a good idea to email the advisor ahead of time with your resume so that they can ask a question based on your resume. But again, this is just for you to, to practice talking, but it's not going to replicate the actual questions that you may get. Um, we also have a software program that's available to all students at Tufts. Um, you have to go in, um, you could do a search for it. You can say Tufts Big Interview. It uses single sign-on. Um, they have a question bank for different types of questions, easy, medium, and hard. There's also professional school questions in there as well. Um, there's quick uh, tutorials on how to answer questions. There's also a part where you can actually record and actually duplicate a mock interview yourself and talk to the camera and smile and then play it back. 
uh, the Career Center and the Pre-Health Advising Office, we don't have access to that recordings. You can record it using the software and play it back and, and kind of hear how you respond and you know practice timing your responses. And then the last thing before I let uh, Rob kind of finish it up is I already mentioned the herd. So the herd, again, for those of you who came in late, is a mentoring database where you can be either paired with a uh, Tufts alumni who has volunteered, or you can just use it to look through volunteer profiles um, and you could search based on major or industry or whether their help topic includes interview prep, learning more about graduate school among a number of different um, help topics. Uh, as far as health professions advising, um, so we, I mentioned the HPRC Canvas course before, so please make sure that you access the Canvas course, particularly the interview process page. Um, later this summer, um, our office is gonna have some more programming directly related to professional school interviews. And we'll also have um, some additional programming throughout um, next fall. Um, which is when the majority of you will actually start getting requests or invitations to interview. So um, please keep an eye out on um, Healthy News and the Canvas courses um, announcements for more information about program um, from our office. And I will just put another little plug in for Big Interview. Um, it is a really neat software and being able to record and then watch that recording of yourself is super cringy, but it's also really good so that you can see your little ticks that you might have that you don't really notice. Muted. You're muted, Malika. So at this point in time, thank you. I'm going to uh, stop the recording and we can take a few questions